hacemos, vamos a hacerlo muy informal, ya que somos poquitos y, y vamos comentando todos igual. No sé si empe empezamos ya, voy o ya, ¿qué hora? ya es la hora, ¿no? ¿Estamos? Sí. Vale, vamos a empezar. Bueno, nada, muchas gracias por eh, venir a escuchar esta humilde, esta humilde presentación. No la preparé, así que es un poco improvisada, pero voy a contar una historia que más o menos sé, porque es algo que me pasó a mí personalmente y que tiene que ver con, con Israel también. Eh, yo trabajé mucho en torno a la comunicación, llevo 10 años casi trabajando en el mundo digital y la comunicación también. Y fui director creativo de una agencia digital y hicimos, trabajé para clientes como Coca-Cola, Orange, Nike y muchos años, y para artistas y para gobiernos. Empezaba con, con corría el año 2009 y el mundo de YouTube en, en el mundo hispano se empezaba a hacer cada vez más fuerte y dentro de lo que era la agencia, si bien que trabajábamos con clientes muy grandes, yo empezaba a tener un interés especial por todo esto de lo que era el mundo YouTube, que me fascinaba y empezaba esta época que empezabas a compartirte links con amigos de cosas increíbles que pasaban en YouTube que no pasaban en ningún otro medio, ¿no? Porque YouTube de alguna manera carecía, no tenía de estos filtros que tenía la tele, los medios, donde hay una especie de programador que decide qué es lo que sí corresponde mirar y qué es lo que no corresponde mirar. No había como una especie de revolución democrática, por así decirlo, del, del contenido. Y empezaron a aparecer fenómenos increíbles. Y había tres videos con los cuales yo me empecé, de alguna manera, a obsesionar. Con tres artistas latinoamericanos, que aquí el amigo ya conoce, que tenían en común que venían de lugares muy humildes en Latinoamérica y habían subido un video que, que en el cual eran absolutamente ellos y tenían una reacción en el público muy fuerte, tanto para los que les gustaba como les parecía un, un insulto al arte contemporáneo o lo que sea. A mí lo que me pasó es que me empecé a obsesionar y a fascinar con lo que esta gente hacía. Por un lado porque seguramente venían de Latinoamérica y yo soy latinoamericano y algo de su lenguaje me parecía familiar. Luego eran absolutamente auténticos, era gente que nunca hubiera aparecido en ningún otro medio que he visto hasta ahora. Y luego tenían una estética propia, una narrativa propia, una musicalidad, un sonido propio. Tenían un montón de cosas que los hacían únicos. Pero todo lo que hacían estaba por fuera de los cánones de lo que habíamos aprendido en las escuelas de arte, de cine. Yo estudié cine particularmente, estudié filosofía y artes en Buenos Aires también. Y me parecía eso. Cuando nos enseñaban que era un artista nos decían que tenga un sonido, un lenguaje propio, una manera propia de contar, una, una huella de identidad reconocible. Y esta gente de alguna manera lo tenía para mí. Entonces un día... Eh, yo hace tres años que había, cuatro años que había venido a vivir a Madrid, había venido a vivir de Israel y estaba un poco enojado con la forma en que los medios trataban a Israel. Me parecía totalmente, si bien Israel en muchas cosas merece una crítica, me parecía absolutamente desproporcionado la manera en que los medios españoles hablan de Israel y lo que se genera en Israel. Entonces quería, siempre quería hacer algo, quería ver qué podía hacer yo para de alguna manera hacer que esta, esta diferencia ¿no? de percepción respecto a lo que pasaba en España y lo que yo había vivido ahí se, digamos, se, normalizara, se normalizara. Entonces, eh, y además, con esta pasión por estos tres artistas y el coso de Israel dije, mira, por fuera de la agencia, yo era el director creativo y el fundador, voy a, quiero hacer algo con estos tíos. Y me parecía que había algo absolutamente delirante en unir a tres artistas latinoamericanos que vienen de lugares, ahora los van a conocer, tú ya lo conoces, increíbles, con el tema de Israel, y me parecía muy potente. Entonces, le pedí a un primo en Buenos Aires en el año 2009, que tenía una productora de, de música, que se me podía ubicar los contactos de Wendy Zulka, una niña de, en ese entonces, nueve años, de los barrios más pobres del Perú, con una, y el contacto de una señora que se llamaba La Tigresa del Oriente, una señora del Amazonas, de 70 años, que era maquilladora de televisión y eh, un día decide empezar su carrera artística y va a su, a su pueblito en el Amazonas y filma un video que se llama Nuevo Amanecer, que les recomiendo muchísimo, es espectacular, y lo sube a YouTube. Y por último, del fin hasta el fin, un ermitaño, un hombre que vivía en las montañas de Río Bamba, Ecuador, solo, 
creador de un género musical que él se autoproclama creador, que es el techno folk andino. Ya han conocido de esas tres personas. En ese entonces no eran muy conocidas. Delfín era el más conocido, tenía un hit, sí, tenía un, una especie de video que había sido bastante popular en YouTube. Pero no eran conocidas, no eran famosas. Vivían solamente dentro de una comunidad de freaks en YouTube, digamos. Y yo había accedido a esa comunidad y, y estaba fascinado con esta, esta gente así. Entonces los con, conseguí el contacto de los tres, los llamé de Delfín a Ecuador, a Wendy a Lima y a la Tigresa del Oriente y les propuse escribir una canción juntos y hacer un video juntos. Íbamos a escribir la letra en colaboración de, a través de internet y luego le dije que íbamos a, a componer una música y a, dirigir, y a hacer un videoclip. Y para la música había un, una persona que se llama Gaby Kerpel en Buenos Aires, que es una de las, de las eminencias de la creación musical del, que combina los folk latinoamericano con, la, con, lo, con el dancehall más potente de, de, de la electrónica. Entonces le, le conté de esto y me dice, no, no se la olvidar, te estoy produciendo un gran evento, él es un productor de shows en Broadway. Le digo, espera, espera Gaby, déjame que te pase los links de estas tres personas y ya tú me contestas. Le mando los links y a la hora tengo una llamada a mi teléfono y me dice, Gaby, no me puedes dejar afuera, estoy adentro, tengo que, tenemos que hacer esto juntos, lo que sea. Y por último me faltaba un director de videoclips y... Hola. Y... ¿Qué tal? ¿En Purias es esta o es aquella? ¿Cuál? En Purias. En sí. Purias es esta. Así que hablamos en español, en español, ¿sí? Vale, genial. Bueno, te pareciste una parte de la historia, pero que fue contactar con tres, con tres, eh, vamos a llamarlos creadores del mundo de YouTube, eh, muy, muy peculiares del mundo latinoamericano, que son Wendy Zulka, Del fin hasta el fin, y La Tigresa del Oriente. No sé si les conoces. ¿Cómo no les conoces? No puede ser. Desde este punto no nada. Vale. Entonces son tres artistas muy peculiares, auténticos, muy populares del mundo, de los universos por ahí más precarios de Latinoamérica dentro de sus países, que un día subieron un video y tuvieron un, una cierta repercusión en la comunidad online. Entonces yo les, les ofrecí hacer una canción, escribir juntos una canción eh, sobre Israel. Y me parecía que era esto, ¿no? Al final la creatividad, si la podríamos definir en esencia, ¿qué sería crear? A ver quién me puede contestar esto. ¿Quién se anima? José, que te tengo... Darle un orden diferente a las cosas. Sí, hay algo que me coincido. Digo, hay muchas definiciones de creatividad, pero para mí una de las que más me gusta es que la creatividad es el producto, o la, la, o sea, la creación de unir dos cosas que no se unían antes, pero que al unirlas se fusionan y al fusionarse se genera una nueva cosa, diferente a lo que era la original. ¿no? Es hacer un link entre cosas que no se unen, linkearlas y de repente que cuando al linkearlas se fusionan bien se produce una especie de nueva cosa con un nuevo sentido más amplio. ¿No? Por ejemplo, a ver, una, voy a buscar un ejemplo de lo que para mí sería una forma sencilla de definir la creatividad y podría ser esta. ¿Qué pasa si sumamos dos cosas que nunca se unían ¿no? antes? Por ejemplo, un gorro, ¿no? lo, lo fusionamos, hacemos un mashup con una sopapa. ¿Qué quedaría? Para una destapar cosetas. Para destapar. ¿Eh? Destapar eh, toilets. Ah, un... ¿Cómo le dicen aquí? Desatascador. Desatascador. Un desatascador con una gorra. Una gorra con desatascador. ¿Qué, ¿Qué nos queda? Nos queda un gorro para dormir en transporte público. ¿No? Tú te pones el gorro con el desatascador, lo pegas contra el vidrio y tu cabeza... Esto sería un mashup, ¿no? Básicamente el acto creativo de alguna manera tiene que ver qué pasa si unimos un, una mopa, ¿cómo le dicen a esto? Una mopa con una ropa de bebé, nos queda el bebé que limpia el suelo. ¿no? Básicamente, de alguna manera, crear quiere decir unir dos cosas que antes no se unían. ¿no? Que, que unir dos cosas que antes nadie las había unido y cuando las unes se forma una nueva cosa. Esto es así, algo así como, se podría decir, que dos ideas se enamoran, salen de copas, hacen el amor y como producto del amor nace una nueva una nueva historia, ¿no? Entonces creo que ese es el acto creativo a nivel universal. Y en el mundo creativo, eh, nada de eso, unir dos cosas que antes nos unían, ¿no? Esa es la base de la creatividad, mezclar. 
Y por eso a mí me parece, a mí me, hay algo que me atrapó del mundo de YouTube, porque es un, YouTube es una especie de canal ¿no? donde existe todo, sin filtro, y es un espacio genial para, para la exploración. ¿no? Y en YouTube se encuentra, no sé, desde los vídeos de un científico muy serio y prominente hasta los vídeos de una quinceañera estridente. ¿no? Un vídeo de un artista serio con la tigresa del oriente que podría ser considerada no, no muy seria. O el encantador de leones, no sé si conocen los, los vídeos de este hombre, el encantador de leones, pero los recomiendo, son increíbles. Con los vídeos creados durante las primaveras árabes o un ballet de una mujer sin piernas con un ballet de drones sincronizados. ¿no? YouTube es un poco un, una especie de canvas, una especie de, de lienzo infinito para la exploración creativa y a mí es algo que me inspiró muchísimo. Bueno, nada, es un canto mongol. Y así fue como, como nació este vídeo que llamamos En tus tierras bailaré. En tus tierras bailaré fue un tema que así un día este, tomó esta decisión de, yo tomé esta decisión de crear este contenido. Me faltaba la parte del vídeo. Encontramos un director de, de, de videoclips en New York, argentino de origen, que dirige vídeos para Julieta Venegas o Juanes o gente muy, muy importante. Y que al mostrarle los videos de Wendy Zulka, Delfín hasta el fin y La Tigresa del Oriente, dijo, quiero hacer esto. Pero tomamos una decisión, dijimos, nos gusta tanto lo que esta gente hace, que nosotros vamos a hacer que nuestra huella como creadores no exista, o sea invisible. Queremos que, entonces les enviamos una cámara, ups, les enviamos una cámara a Wendy, a Lima, una cámara a La Tigresa, en Perú, en el Amazonas y una cámara del delfín, les dijimos, hagan el vídeo que más les guste a ustedes con esta canción que escribimos juntos. Y así es como comenzó, un día subimos el, el vídeo a YouTube, sin más. Lo, lo, ¿Quién escribió la canción? Yo la escribí. ¿Y quién le puso la música? Gaby Kerpel le puso la música Ajá. y el, la realización del vídeo la hizo Piqui Talarico, que es este realizador. Con el insumo que te devolvieron cada uno de ellos. Les mandamos una cámara, filmaron cada uno, en, les pedimos que hagan una jornada de filmación en exteriores y una en estudio con chroma key para que nosotros podamos editarla y montarla. Okay. Y entonces grabaron, nos enviaron todos los materiales luego por FedEx y nosotros lo montó Piki entre New York, la música en Buenos Aires y la dirección la hice yo desde Madrid. Y un día lo subimos a YouTube, les voy a mostrar el video y ahora les cuento lo, lo que pasó. ¿vale? Preparen sus retinas, porque puede ser danino para algunos, pero... No, vamos a ponerlo así. Perdón, eh. Mira, vamos a ponerlo entero. Así les duele un poco más.
है Bueno, ¿qué les parece? English or Spanish? English. English. So we'll, I, I'll try to teach to, to English, because Hebrew there are many of them. Yeah. So we just upload the video, and we never expected to to have a reaction as we had. We did it this way because because in first in first term we love what this three naive artists there, or characters, or celebrities, or how you want to call them, they were originally doing. On the other hand, we, we were involved in different projects regarding Israel in communication. And when people think about Israel, they activate their rational side of the, of the mind. They want to argue, they want to tell different things, you know, on why they, they are agree on what Israel is and what they are against what Israel is, so we, didn't, we wanted to avoid this arguing situation, we wanted just to enter through happiness, fun, delirium, and, and speak about that this way. What happens here is that we uploaded the video and we got like, immediately a tweet. It was like we did it in Spain and we did it at 8 at night in Spain. When we woke up in the morning there was this tweet. For the ones who are waking up, something historic happened in the internet today. This was like a kind of a important tweet that was advancing what happens. The Twitter was completely, you know, exploding in tweeting this video. Many celebrities in the world, such as the singer of Calle 13, which is the main, the most important Latin American band, was tweeting, this is the best mashup ever I saw in my life. It's like seeing together Madonna, Lady Gaga and Michael Jackson. You know, a lot of fun. Nobody was speaking about the Israeli facts. People were just enjoying and sharing the content and speaking on social networks about this content, about this thing. And without conscience, people were singing Israel, Israel, how, how fun and how nice is Israel. This song becomes like a huge hit. It was all over the media in Latin America, mainly in Spain and then all over the world. Actually, Al Gore publishes on his current TV blog saying that this is the best video, crazy video they you can see this week. And the, uh, the group no, we, we mash up, we put it together to sing for the first time. It was like the We Are The Word, remember that song, the Latin bizarre We Are The Word, we went to, of YouTube. So we put it together, we, we created a song. 
and it was a huge media impact all over the world, Twitter. Then what something great that happens is that the community took it at its, its own and they were start creating the community in YouTube like thousands and thousands of celebrations, homages and, and tributes to these guys, you know, wearing customs and and making new versions of this video. It was like thousands and thousands on the net. I don't want to be. And the craziest thing of this delirium is that becomes the sixth, the sixth most viewed video all over the world in YouTube this, that week. On, you, we were on top Lady Gaga's that, that weekend uh, release and we were asking ourselves why this content is so powerful? Why, you know, Lady Gaga is just launching a big, huge budget video all over the world and we are getting more engagement with our video. There are a lot of different responses to this. I think one is that the community can make it their own. You know, they feel these are social heroes. They were nobody and one day, they, without passing through the filters of the media, they become like huge success, global success. So with this story took, you, took us very far in some, in some way. Because with all this, you know, crazy engagement and we had this idea of for the first time, putting all these digital new celebrities into a live event, which we call it the U Fest, and we did a pilot, which was a small pilot, a small party in Argentina and Buenos Aires in a contemporary center for art. And we put together these three guys, we brought them from Peru and from Ecuador to Argentina, we brought video creators and DJs, and we created like a, the first digital pop culture celebration in the, in the offline world. So to make a short story long, it was a huge success. These three guys rock it live together. There was a sold out, completely sold out for two nights. 4,000 people each night. We expected to do something like, you know, very niche, very small. We, we get, the, the, the incredible thing is that we got like super good critics from the media and from the experts and the, we were all over we, we, the primetime TV shows were asking us to Wendy Delfina La Tigresa to go to their talent shows and programs. You know, we, we, there was like a kind of a um, journalist guard in the hotel, the very modest hotel where they were staying in Buenos Aires. It was like completely crazy. Actually, we end, we end up in the cover of Rolling Stone magazine with the show. And MTV came, came to cover these shows the second night live. You know, it was completely unexpected. And the, and the incredible thing is that the song, this song, Israel, Israel, and Tosir Rafael becomes a huge Latin American hit. People were dancing on the parties, on discotheques. There was all the time on the radio. And people without, you know, understanding that Israel or why this you know, why they were trying to rationally understand that this is for Israel. They were, the song getting to their, their hearts and thousands and thousands of people were just singing like that Israel is an amazing place because they love the content. And after doing this first pilot, we get to, we, go, we went to London when we spoke with the YouTube headquarters for Europe and we told, we tell, we spoke, we tell them our story, what happens with this video, what happened with this party we did in, our, in Buenos Aires. And we, after one, almost one year of negotiations, we, we convinced them to put the money to make like a new festival, a new concept, a global for YouTube stars bringing light into life. Not just only this freak niche, but creativity, sports, music, humor, in the, all the most popular different categories in, in YouTube. We built this kind of a huge video, live video player where the video and the live artists will interact together in real time. And we finally, yeah, we got the, the YouTube support and Google, and we did in Madrid a second version of this first idea, but we have big repercussion also international this time, just to have a brief feeling of what was, how was the event. Just like how you troll around YouTube And this festival ends up with all the crowd there singing Israel, Israel, que bonito es Israel, with Delphine when they are there. Sorry? 
Sorry? I don't have it here, but yes, it's in YouTube. I will send to you. Yeah, we brought like 60 artists from 20 different countries, all YouTube creators with millions, yeah, YouTube stars with millions of views online. We brought them offline. So this is the, how Israel and the, something like kind of a delirium brought us like as far as we never imagined, just from having fun and con connecting things that mm, naturally they don't have a connection, no? like these Latin American artists with Israel, who is, that, that's the idea and I, I wanted No. No, no. I think like it was people di didn't believe that these three Latin American emerging artists were like how they finish singing about Israel. You know, oh, that was the crazy. Yeah, yeah it was. Because, uh, that was the the, the important. That was the I think the the, the creative disruption, like people like connecting two things that seems to be very delirant, and b since they looked very delirant, it you know it brought us. To what was the reaction when you first approached them and asked them to do a song? There's an Argentinian guy calling them from Barcelona, hey, would you like to do a song? And you know, they, they were at that time like dreaming to be stars. They wanted to do something. So For them, I think, it was me who I sounds Argentinian, living in Europe. For them, it's like huge, you know, they came from small, Very poor humble. villages in, in Latin America. They will never, they will not dream about that. They just, Actually, they didn't upload though, their videos to YouTube. There was like the, the son of a friend who uploaded the videos to YouTube, and suddenly they become like having to start a, like a huge community commenting on these videos, saying half of the community is just yelling on them, and the other half is saying this is brilliant, this is like the most amazing and authentic thing they ever saw. And some and the other thing is like for for example in the events we did in in Argentina and in Madrid. The artist community, like the mainstream, elitistic artist community, designers, video creators, crea creative directors, etc., they were so engaged with this content. They, they came in, so there was something happening there, you know, so, something authentic. And in the, in the subject of Israel, do they have any opinion or they couldn't care less? They? Well, they don't have an opinion. They, they are completely, I think, they were completely ignorant in terms. For them, they, they are Christians. Uh -huh. And some of them, one of them is a, a kind of an evangelic, uh -huh. so they love Israel. Okay. They love the Holy Land, let's say. Uh -huh. So for them, there was, in Latin America, it's different than here. It was like uh, kind of beautiful for them, you know, to sing for Israel. <coughs> but now, La Tigresa del Oriente, she has a tourist company and she organized trips to Israel for Peruvians. Uh -huh. And she, it's, it's so weird, it's so crazy that, for example, she, when she brings these committees of people from the Peru, you no, know, to, to, to Israel, she, she, she makes bautismos, how do you say that in English? Uh, yeah. Baptisms in the Jordan River, uh -huh. and she, she, she's organizing a trip through the Nilos, uh -huh. and she's singing in, on the ship on the Nilos, Israel, Israel, and she thinks that Egypt is part of the Holy Land, it's Israel, you know, she don't, she don't, she don't get there. So there are, you have thousands of people, well, thousands or hundreds of people like singing on the ship, you know, with her, this Israel in Egypt, so it's kind of a delirant uh, thing, you know, happening in there. But it, what it was so good is that engage so many people to have fun related to a content that is related to Israel. Usually when people think about Israel, it thinks about war, extremism, whatever, orthodox. So uh, what I like it from this experience is that this content get direct to their hearts, you know. Nobody was, like the rational side of the arguing about Israel is completely on the side with this. How many views? We have like, we, we stopped content, counting like many years ago. It, this was in 2010. But the last time we counted Media Impact, it was more like 50 million. 50? Yeah, 50 million. No, yeah, it was all over, like mainstream media all over the world, yeah. This content and the story about them and the story about Israel and how did they... It was mainly from Latin America. 
At the beginning, no, it started in Latin America. We are we see like in the statistics of the con of the video, and right there's a lot of traffic from Europe, from Asia, yeah, and the U.S. The U.S. is one of the main uh, the main markets for this. And you make a video of the site before or after? Yeah, yeah. I, I was a, I worked as a creative director for for brands and and for many years. Yeah, I did a lot of video content. for video content. Yeah. Nothing like this. Uh, this was the first, let's like, say, big hit. After this, we got like... Yeah, because it's $40. You say, these are the guys that made Israel Israel, and everybody knows what it is. Yeah, but after this, we, we did several hits in YouTube also, not just for Israel. We did one a campaign for Mexico. We did a big campaign for Nike, YouTube video based. What brought your attention to these characters, to these people? <sighs> it's, an, an, it's, it's difficult to, to, to understand, but I think... You know, you, where you come from? Venezuela. Venezuela. So you, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Like, we, we live it like in kind of a crazy, bi bipolar um, situation. Realism. Yeah, magic realism, yeah. Magic realism. When you travel for Venezuela, you go through the small towns and you see this kind of people. You know, yeah. you understand them. And uh, for, for at least me, I love that culture. You know, I was always engaged with this side of the folk, Nate, um, whatever. Aesthetics, music, I like f Latin American folk music a lot. So for me, it was kind of wow, shocking, you know, seeing this on a mainstream media. I never saw that this before because they are not exposed in, tele in television. Yeah. If they are in television, they are in the, in the, in the news because they robbers, you know, a, a white man. Mm -hmm. So I like it for the first time. You know, there, there was something empowering happening there. Well, right now they are giving concerts all over Latin America. They go to TV shows all over Latin America. They have a book. Si la Tigresa del Oriente wrote the book. Wendy is, is, is the, an actress and she's shooting a, a feature film. Um, so it also helps them, you know, to, to, to reach their dream. Actually, we are good friends. We spoke like many times in the year. And we I, and after that we do we do I wrote they asked me to write for them some songs and to they ask me for feedback for anything they do because it was a great experience you know yeah 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 could say yeah. Yeah. Ask, ask, ask yeah. The other town. Ask yeah. 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 For for weird people, but after we did U Fest, we were working like with mainstream YouTube celebrities, as Danny McCaskey, like the most famous bike rider in the world, Marquis Scott, the most popular street dancer in YouTube, with a lot of like well-renowned YouTubers and creators. So I I'm working a lot with YouTube network right now of creators. We, we ha I have a company that is Inspired Cities and we, we, in, we put together YouTube creators with destinations so they make content around cities and destinations to tourist promotion, for example. What, what is it that the big weird is that you're going from YouTube to traditional concerts. Why you do that? I mean, you know, it seems kind of weird going back. Yeah, but the, the content right now is liquid, you know, it's transmedia. We, there is this effect of ROPO, research online, portraits offline. So at, at the first, you know, the first you first went to, to explore this idea of bringing some online phenomena to an offline, because they, they, they had a big audience, you know, millions of people seeing them. And these people are having fun around the, their content. So we saw there was an opportunity also in the offline world to to monetize and to, to, to make a business of that. But I think that the content is liquid, like it's not or online or offline. We, we live in both sizes. Like we are a human off on, off on. Like we are kind of having a life on and a life off. And it's very important to, to connect that for the value. Well, that's well how does the UFES go now? So where do you do the UFES? Now we finished with the UFES in 2013 as a business, because we, we hadn't actually, we learned, we have a lot of learnings because we, we didn't run the business the right way, UFS, let's say. We have like huge media attraction, huge, huge user attraction, but to, to make a live festival, you need a lot of backing in terms of 
of fin finance, and we didn't got that. And actually, we partnered with with some with some partners that they were in charge of the finance, let's say, module of the company, and they, they we didn't wear strategy. Well, you know, the strategy wasn't enough good to to survive. Like you, when you are doing a like a big festival, you need three years of at least of losing money and then you get to break even. We, didn't, we were too young, you know, we were too young to, in the festival industry. We just do it, did it because it was part of a kind of a phenomenon. But we didn't have been like really having well preparation for that, I think. So. Why don't you take it to the roadshow or take it further to the stage? Because it was a very complicated partner it's situation. It's a, yeah, it's a very powerful concept. Actually, we got YouTube on board and Google on board from San Francisco, Europe, and here. Actually, it was a kind of a complicated uh, period. Also, in YouTube, the, the head of strategy was changing all the time. They were looking for, they didn't understand how also YouTube is going to work because YouTube is not making enough money till now, these days even. So they were changing, so we didn't have like a counterpart, clear counterpart in YouTube to, to work together with in one hand and actually we were so tight we got like partnership problems between the partners we didn't there was no kind of a partnership affection to keep the business running we wanted just to you know close it and move to the next page but yeah it has a i think it has it has great potential yeah great great thank you very much for hearing